You're listening to Coding Blocks, episode 46. Subscribe to us and leave us a review in iTunes, Stitcher, and more using your favorite podcast app. Visit us at codingblocks.net where you can find show notes, examples, discussion, and more. Send your feedback, questions, and rants to comments at codingblocks.net and follow us on Twitter at codingblocks or head to www.codingblocks.net and find all our social links there at the top of the page. With that, I'm Alan Underwood, the not Southern sounding guy. Wait. <laughs> wow, that's not going to get confusing. <laughs> um, Egon. Uh, my name is... <laughs> And it's Joe Zach. I got distracted, man. You guys took me off. Yeah, I'm Joe Zach. No, you're you gone. And 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 hi, y'all. I'm Michael Outlaw. <laughs> there it is. All right. Now nobody will be confused from here on out. No, I'm pretty sure that we just totally threw everyone off. <laughs> so with that, welcome to Coding Blocks. So for those not in the know, what happened was uh We should uh, just start over. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we're good. So so uh, I was still filling in notes. <laughs> Reddit was good to us, and uh, you know one one piece of comment that came back from it though is that uh, uh, several people commented that they had a hard time differentiating our voices because we all sound the same. And one guy one guy described us as uh, Alan talks Southern, Michael talks fast, and Joe sounds like Egon. <laughs> Uh, that was That'd an amazing. Be so post. happy, yeah. You, you actually you liked that one and and replied. Oh yeah, I'm so a redditor. I'll, so from now on, I'll just do the show introductions as like a hi y'all. <laughs> this is Coding Blocks. Hey, don't you? We need we need to give some credit for whoever whoever put that in there, right? Because it was. Uh, oh, I don't remember who that specific comment was that you know was talking about how we sound, but uh, this all started from a uh, a Reddit about you know my top eight must listen developer podcasts and uh, the lesser nut responded back because uh, coding blocks was not listed. And uh, at least when I looked at it, we were the, you know, part of the top comment. Uh, Alan seems to uh, have seen some different results. Yeah. The, the top comment was nobody has time to listen to eight podcasts on programming. <laughs> so, it, but it was pretty cool to see us pop up in there because we definitely don't go and seed those things. So that, that was amazing. Yeah. That was totally yeah. awesome. It's yeah. really cool to see something that you did on Twi- on Reddit and not get beaten down into the ground. Oh, totally, man. That's usually what happens. This is just, it's a pound fest. Like you get killed on those things. So that, yeah, sometimes that did, the internet just can be so cruel. Yeah. So that, that but was, this time it wasn't. That so, was a smile. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. a smile for all of us. You got to take your small victories where you get them. So it, with continuing with the smiles, we got a few more reviews in iTunes and oh, Stitcher. Man. I feel like I should go ahead and use this good karma to read these names because I think I can say these. No, man, this one's too easy. That's not fair. No, come on. Uh, hold on. Do, do, we don't even have any hard ones this time. So yeah, yeah go so, ahead and do them so, all. <laughs> so <laughs> no, these are totally hard. Uh, <laughs> iTunes is... Uh, How do you say this? Mr. Automation, (laughs) Uh, Nat, Eve, Chubb 5000, because the other 4,999 were already taken, (laughs) Traveler Bell, and LaCarin. And then in Stitcher, we got some love there from Ryan Webb Jackson and Lucky Coding. Yep. Thank you very much for all those. They they truly made our days. And uh, yeah, I mean, just amazing stuff. So appreciate that. Keep them coming. You know, if you if you find five minutes and you're bored out of your mind, there's a good time to go sit down and write a review for Coding Blocks. Hey, and you know what? Just just to take take a lesson out of the Lesser Nuts uh, playbook. And if you see something mentioned on on Reddit where you think that we would be a good fit, hey, you know we we won't mind. Yeah. It won't it won't hurt our feelings. Throw us in there. We love it. Love yep. it. Thank you. Says Egon. And <laughs> and speaking of love. SwanseaCon is coming up. It's a conference that we talked about last year. Uh, focuses on like refactoring, um, code smells, agile coding practices. Just some really great talks. And it's coming up. It's in South Wales, uh, which is very far from me, unfortunately, because I really want to go. But it's uh, September 12th through 13th uh, in South Wales. And I uh, just wanted to read a couple of my favorite um, talks, talk titles in there. Um, talks like Refactoring Code Smells, 10X Dollar Myth, and my favorite, from Jurassic Park to microservices. That's an amazing title. Yeah, I've worked with some dinosaur code bases, so that uh, that one felt good. And uh, we have some really good news this year. We have a couple tickets to give away. What? So, 
Yeah. If you think you're going to be able to make it to South Wales, which uh, I know is a little difficult for some people, but if you think you can make it to South Wales, September 12th to the 13th, then I want you to tweet at Coding Blocks with the hashtag SwanseaCon, and that's S-W-A-N-S-E-A-Con. So tweet to us with the hashtag SwanseaCon, and we'll enter you into the contest, and uh, you could potentially win a ticket, which is worth uh, you know up to uh, 450 pounds, or you know for us uh, Americans, uh, around 600 bucks. And don't hey, don't be upset if I somehow win the drawing. <laughs> yeah, <no laughs> well, do us a favor though. Like, only bother to to tweet if you're truly interested in going, because that's a commitment to go to yeah. the South Wales. Yeah, and I mean, if you're in the UK, which several of our listeners are, this is an excellent There's opportunity. Yeah, so um, you know, definitely tweet us. It, it looks like it's going to be an amazing conference. And again, don't be upset if I accidentally win this somehow. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I feel like we won't be seeing Alan much in September. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, the, the flight is not included, so uh, I won't be there this year. But hopefully if I talk real good about him, maybe next year. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, this is just the ticket, you know, the tickets to the conference, yeah. period. Yeah. Uh, you're on your own for room and board and travel and all that. Yep. All right. So what we got next? We had some fantastic comments on our last show. Um, we got a lot of feedback about it, uh, as usual, and in particular, there were three comments on the actual uh, link for that, on the, uh, rather, the uh, the show notes for it, if you go to www.cuttingblocks.net slash episode 45. I uh, wanted to call out three in particular. Russell Hammett had a great video of Grace Hopper discussing and visualizing nanoseconds, which was a hard thing for me to pronounce, let alone, let alone visualize, <laughs> so that's a, a great video. Uh, Carol Ann always uh, granting us some great perspective, uh, mentioning uh, talking about our poll and how um, sometimes uh, discrimination can kind of masquerade as other things and a great tie-in with imposter syndrome there. Um, Jerry Shannon had a fantastic presentation uh, he linked to. Um, for uh, the title, the, the presentation was Low-Level Details for High-Level Developers, which has already piqued my interest. So um, you guys should go check that out in the comment section. Awesome. Uh, I had a link here. I uh, really wish we would have mentioned this last time. I thought about it and somehow didn't make it into the notes. But um, there is a funny news story that kind of made the rounds, uh, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago about Amazon wanting to ship your package before you actually order it. And I thought this was a great example of some of the caching things that we talked about last episode and uh, tie into temporal locality. Of course, Amazon isn't actually going to ship a package to you before you order it. But what they would do is ship packages that they think people in your area are more likely to buy to a warehouse closer to you. So if you live in, say, Boston, then they might start shipping popular coats and, you know, snowshoes uh, to a warehouse near, near you in the winter months. And if you live in Florida, like I do, they might start uh, sending things like bathing suits uh, to my local warehouse in December. That's pretty cool. And so... Yeah, we'll have a link to that. It's a, just a cool little story about what, what they're doing there. Unfortunately, it's patented, so don't think about doing this. You will get sued into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of tying into our topic last week, uh, or not last week, but you know, last episode, and you know, we went through all the different levels of caching and specifically talked about uh, memory and you know, access speed to it. Have you guys heard about this new breakthrough that Intel and Micron made? No. Nope. called 3D X point and it's a new non-volatile memory and security now did a, a great um, explanation of it. So we'll have links to everything in there because it's way better than, you know, anything I could, I still, I need to go back and listen to it again just to be able to comprehend it. But yeah, it's this new technology that, that Intel and Micron have come out with a thousand times faster than NAND a thousand times the endurance of NAND and ten times denser than conventional memory. That's amazing. <laughs> NAND, like, is it not AND? Um. Okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we'll I go think with it might that. Be. It's basically yeah, it's like, the technology that all SSDs have been using for a while, right? Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I took a, a class on a long time ago. We talked about like logical gates, ands, or nands, xors, oh, all yeah. sorts of stuff. I don't know if that's a tie in there. I don't know if, enough about it. I've never actually seen one of those gates in real life or talked about it in the workplace. So uh, I, I keep hoping to use some of this knowledge that I picked up back at school. 
yet. I mean, this this stuff just sounds amazing. And and supposedly this is um, not just theory talk either. Like this is stuff that's going to be hitting the real world. Um, I think they said by the end of the year, oh, by like sometime within 2016, it was supposed to be coming out. Now, I don't know if this is going to be like that 60 gig terabyte or I'm sorry, 60 gig terabyte. <laughs> Why don't I just make some stuff up? 100 meg terabyte. Yeah. You know, <laughs> sounds amazing. I'll take two of those. Uh, the 60 terabyte SSD that was only for, um, you know, commercial use or, you know, expected to only be used for commercial use because it was going to be ultra expensive. So who knows, you know, this thing might start off, start out its life that way, but uh, it still sounded very interesting. And, and um, I just found it kind of like timely considering the last episode and the conversation we had there. That'll be our next level of cash, right? That's amazing. Um, yeah. I mean, well, I don't know about using it for cash necessarily or just memory what, but you know, whatever. Very cool. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. All right, so next up, uh, Outlaw and I actually visited a React JS plus Elixir plus Rethink DB meetup that was pretty interesting. It was talking about creating real time reactive apps, and Elixir in the middle was basically for the uh, you know nine nines of of uptime type reliability, and Rethink DB was kind of interesting because it was a database that had it was almost like event streaming to where when you update the database, it sends out events that people can subscribe to. It was almost like a stack or a queue built into a database. So that was kind of interesting. Um, the The cool part about the meetup and the part that went completely over my head was when they were flashing through the examples of the code on screen. Like, I didn't understand any of it. Oh, uh, yeah, because Elixir, let's see if I have this right now. Because it was Elixir and Phoenix. So Phoenix was built on top of Elixir. And Elixir is built on top of Haskell, right? Uh, Erlang? No, Haskell? yeah, you're Erlang. right. Erlang. Yeah. Erlang. Um, and that's where the, the, the five nines came in. Yep. Uh, a reliability because it was based on Erlang. And if you've never done any Erlang before, then you look at that stuff and you're like, Hey man, you you got a typo there, <laughs> like twenty of them. You're missing some stuff. <laughs> Where are your braces at? Like everything just looks wrong, and yet it works amazingly well. And uh, you know, it started off. The conversation started off too with this whole conversation about functional programming, mm -hmm. and you know that's part of the way that uh, Erlang is able to make its claim about its reliability because this thing started out um, with something that Sony Ericsson had. Uh, you know, started out for, you know, they needed it for telecommunication purposes. And because it was for telecommunication purposes and, and had to be relied upon, then it had to have, uh, you know, ultra high reliability. And, um, you know, they had servers that ran for decades using this thing. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was, Elixir was built on top of that. But, um, and then, you know, this was, it was a React meetup, but it kind of really wasn't a React meetup. Yeah. It was more like this other cool stuff. So yeah, React and Redux were there at the presentation layer, but really, you know, what stole the show was Elixir and Phoenix, and then Rethink DB. Which, if you've never looked at Rethink DB, um, to me, I don't know if you is this your takeaway. It was almost like, hey, what if your database? provided a pub sub model that's exactly that's what i'm saying like, it was like a queue on top of a database yeah i mean it was like well yeah see that's where like hmm, i mean maybe you could call it a queue but like i the, like when people say when you think of pub sub it definitely kind of sounds like because you could say like hey i want to subscribe to this table yep and just tell me anytime there's a change to it or i want to subscribe to this query that's what it was and more, tell yeah. me tell me if new results for this query ever come back so you never had to query your database for information. The database would just tell you like, oh, well, here's the here's the new value or the new you know row for that uh, for that result for that query result. And you know, it would just publish it out to everyone who needed to know. It was it was pretty interesting stuff and I'd never really heard of Rethink DB, so it was neat to see how that was done. Um, I, I don't think it's something you plug into your existing architecture. and it, But, I mean, it's just kind of nice seeing all this stuff that's out there. The one topic that we won't go into here, but I thought was really interesting that he brought up, is he he said um, 
think composition over inheritance and don't share anything. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a right. second. I'm an object-oriented guy. Like, I've been doing OO for a long time. What do you mean don't share anything and don't think inheritance? It, and, it, you know, I ended up going and looking the stuff up. And maybe we'll do a part of another episode on this. But, you know, maybe if you want to do some Googling just to get some background information, it is a, a pretty neat concept and one that – that makes a lot of sense. And there's a wiki article that I'll, I'll, uh, I'll link to in the show notes here, but yeah, I was sitting next to Alan and I, I had to hold him back, you know, cause he <laughs> wanted to jump out of the seat when the guy was like, don't share. Uh, <laughs> it was like, my mama said, <laughs> so, you know, let's do this. <laughs> Of course, the Southern guy and yeah. his mama. Well, is the well, mama's always right. That's mama's right. Always right. Well, isn't it Billy? I can't. I can't remember. Well, mama Billy said, Madison. No, no, no. You're thinking of uh, uh, the water, water boy. boy. Yeah. Mama said alligators yeah. got nobody to clean their teeth. That's why they always angry. <laughs> no, they're so ornery. They're so ornery. They got so many teeth. <laughs> it's a brush. Well, all you're right. just messing up this quote yeah, all together. I, I, uh, so there are a lot of benefits to functional pro- program. We should really talk about one of these days. But I really got to wonder, like, how many people are doing uh, uh, how much true functional programming in the workplace? You know, it seems if you're doing kind of line to business, like normal day to day stuff, like I just don't really see that stuff too often. But I understand the benefits of of having you know having no shared data. You know, you can split stuff off um, really easily. You can. Um, you can cache stuff. It's much easier to test, much easier to work with. Well, that's what um, I was about it, to say. It, just yeah, think about like any time anytime you've ever written any type of method that even quasi acted functional, right? Like you weren't, might not have even been trying to write, you know, any kind of functional code, but you know, maybe it just lucked out to be that way, right? Those are always the easiest uh, pieces of code to go back and write unit tests for. Always. Yeah, an input and a guaranteed output, right? There's yeah. no state mutation. So that's I mean, that's, that is my favorite kind of code to write right there. I will say, though, I've been looking at some, I hate this term, big data things here lately, <laughs> but uh, Apache Spark, like one of the languages that is sort of the uh, default chosen one that you can write things in, or Scala, and they say that a way a lot of people do the transforms is functional. So if you want to learn something, maybe that's a good way to go about it. So I, I've kind of been looking at that a little bit, but it hurts my head. Like, it, it is so foreign to me. So <laughs> it's totally not where I thought you were going to go. I don't know where you thought I was going to go. <laughs> so, so a little background here. A friend of ours told us about this great project that he had heard of that Apache <laughs> uh, had been working on. And, and it was great. And it had all these great features, right? All these amazing things that it could do. And like all of us were like, oh, that sounds great. That sounds amazing. Or at least the, you know, the ma- majority, there might've been like one or two, uh, out of a handful of people that that uh, you know didn't didn't buy into it originally you know, all the way, but you know for the most part everybody was like, oh no, that sounds great, and just took him at face value, and it turned out he totally made up this Apache <laughs> project. <laughs> and I t- I swear when you said this Apache project, I was like, oh god, here we go, Apache Indigo. That's what he called it. And the thing is, the name is so good that well, it was so believable. <laughs> I didn't want to give the name out because now it's out there on the internet. Now it could become something. That's no, gonna be a project. And, and then it'd be like, then he'd be like, no, see, I told you, there it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, way to go, man. You just broke the internet. I did. All right, so now it's time to roll into the episode. Let's get this rolling. So, so what's our topic today? Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about application caching. And uh, just to give you some context, last episode we did a bottom-up approach. We talked about um, some hardware latency numbers that, uh, quote, all programmers should know. We had a great article and uh, some great numbers that we pulled from there. And we talked about basically relative speeds of CPUs uh, all the way up to sending packets uh, across the world, which was 300 million times slower. And we were building up to basically talking about um, caching and how basically storing a smaller subset of your data in a faster, closer memory location can make an astronomical difference in uh, in your your performance. And when we're talking about performance like this, it's not so much about saving some microseconds. It's the difference between being able to do something and, and not being able to do it, frankly. So knowing these numbers can help you make really smart architectural decisions about your application. But today, we want to focus on something a little bit more practical to actor, actual like day-to-day programmers, the kinds of things and decisions that you make on a daily basis and um, the, things that, the kinds of things that are, that are available to you if you're actually building an application. 
And we're gonna do that by focusing in on one specific framework. Now don't get scared. These are principles and these are the kinds of things that um, are available in all sorts of frameworks that are similar. So um, this is gonna to apply to you no matter what you stack your work on, but we are focusing today on ASP.NET. Only the greatest possible yeah. programming. No, it, it's just the framework that we mostly work in day to day. So I can't take you serious. <laughs> no, I mean, for, for the people that like Java out there, or Python or whatever, I mean, it's just the tools that we use, right? That we're the most comfortable talking about. But the again, like you said, the concepts apply across the board. So, um, you know, ASP.NET is the web version of the C-sharp library that, or the code that we use, the language. And, you know, it, that's it. It's just easy to talk about web as far as caching because it's something that people can kind of understand because there's so many different layers of it, and it's easy to talk about those different layers. So, um, yeah, we're going to start and talk about this a little bit. Yeah, and so ASP.NET is an open source. Crazy, I know, right? Well, it's an now. open source framework. <laughs> yeah. For, uh, I like how you say that now. Like, if you if we tried to have this conversation a year ago, then you wouldn't have been able to make that claim. No, not even close. No, but it's true. It, it's out there. It's crazy. Uh, open source framework for creating web applications and web services, and it provides tools for dealing with things like web requests, responses, cookies, sessions. Um, you know, utilities for encoding uh, HTML. Um, uh, what you call it, uh, URLs, all sorts of stuff. It's just um, dealing with writing websites and uh, services. And it works in conjunction with .NET, which is a much um, bigger entity that deals with stuff like system IO, file systems, networking, all, all the kind of um, you know more general programming type stuff. And I'm curious, uh, you guys are both obviously very familiar with ASP.NET, but why would you choose to work in something like ASP.NET over, say, Ruby on Rails or uh, Node.js? The tooling is probably like Visual Studio is just an amazing IDE. So that's one. And honestly, I couldn't have said this a year ago, like we were just talking about with the open source thing. But now the fact that it is truly going cross-platform with ASP.NET Core, that is one of the reasons why, like at one point, Node.js was one of the things that I was like, sweet, I can put this anywhere, right? But now you can do that with, with ASP.NET. And that to me is huge. So uh, the IDE and the cross-platform ability of it now. So I do, I, I'm with you on the IDE. And that is one thing that I've always uh, loved about you know, any kind of uh, development on a Microsoft platform that Visual Studio is just always, um, I, don't, I don't know. I, mean, I know some people just truly hate it, but for me, that has never been the case. But honestly, I got to say, like, if I were starting out all over again, like I think a big part of where where I why I ended up in C sharp and .NET was just the momentum. Yeah, the, you know, having already come from like um, MFC for example and Win thirty two, and then you know it was just the next progression was oh it's .NET C sharp right, and so the momentum just carried me there. That if I didn't have that momentum I and mean, I was starting over, I'd, I don't know. I mean, I'd probably be really tempted to like a, a Node JS for example. You know, a Ruby, I mean, that those sound, you know, amazing. You just don't get Visual Studio. So I'll tell you why I, or, or when I would choose ASP.NET for a project. When the project is big. When I want the benefits of a static language, being able to um, have like compile time, or rather um, edit time in IntelliSense, if I'm going to be interacting with a lot of different libraries, if I, if I have a very large code base, like millions of lines, then and I'm making a website, I want it to be ASP.NET over, say, Java or, or Go or you know, any sort of other static language. Uh, basically, anywhere I want a static language and a website, I want ASP.NET. If I'm doing a little, uh, you know, hokey site that kind of reads from API and, you know, some sort of like, uh, you know, calendar or something, just some sort of small application, you know, 2,000 lines or less, then ASP.NET is not my go-to. I would do that in Node.js or, or PHP or what? Well, I wouldn't do PHP, sorry. <laughs> Ruby on Rails, something like no, that. No, you heard it here first, guys. He said <laughs> oh. he would do PHP. Hey, but tell me tell me this, though. You said that you would do ASP.NET over Java. Why that distinction there for a large... Because, I mean, there's Java Enterprise and there's lots of apps written in Java. So yeah. why, why .NET over that? C Sharp is the major reason by far. Love the language. It's got a ton of advantages. I mean, Link... It right there is, is enough 
is enough reason to choose C sharp uh, over Link for or over uh, Java for me. But uh, also, um, there's some stuff. It's this is pretty pathetic, but Java is such a huge ecosystem that I just get kind of overwhelmed and intimidated by all the choices that I have, even for just figuring out how to build my project. And so I don't want to do a, a freaking research project on like Maven versus Gradle yep. before I even get to starting on my site. Yep, I, I was actually going to say the same thing. That was one of the attractive things to me for .NET was the fact that there's typically like there's there's sort of the the standard way of doing things that's easy to follow. Like Entity Framework is one of the most popular ORMs in .NET, right? Like that's almost always a de facto choice. Um, like just certain things are so much easier to pick. Whereas if you go over to Java, like it, there's this whole world of choices, which is amazing because it makes the community better. But then it's always, well, what am I giving up to do this? Like it, it's, it's a lot of decision making and that can really wear you down. Well, I'll be curious to see though. Like, I mean... Uh, I feel like I feel like we're, we're y- your argument gets to pick uh, th- the best of what you want it to be though because like you get to pick that it's open source well that just happened right you get to pick that it doesn't have all the you know um, the options that the Java environment has you know you mentioned like uh, Maven versus Gradle over you know and uh, hey for some that's actually a huge plus on yeah. the Java side is that they do have options like that but again because you know, it is so new to be an open source. Like there are a lot of those options that haven't happened. So this is the 1995 version of Java, <laughs> right? Like, like open source, when you talk about .NET being open source, like it's the 1995 version of it. It's that, inf- you know, Brand that much in its infancy. Yeah. So it's kind of like, well, I don't know if you're really comparing apples to apples when you, when you make some of those claims. I mean, I hear you and I, I don't, I don't disagree with it. I mean, I, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, the the complexity and the choices that you have out there, you, I mean, you could definitely do a, a whole uh, thesis on it if you wanted to. Um, on, the, on the when I wouldn't choose .NET, though, it's when I want to play with something new. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. in all honesty, like Node.js, I'd do it because it's fun. Um, yeah, but, I mean, ultimately, for me, uh, it's all about developer productivity. So if I feel like I'm going to save more time by dealing with, uh, you know, Visual Studio and uh, kind of a head, heavy IDE, then I'm going to do that. If I think that I'm going to be able to, you know, use a, a lightweight uh, solution or uh, editor like Sublime or Visual Studio Code, and I'm going to be able to get away with JavaScript, and that's going to be a quicker solution, then that's what I'm doing because it's all about saving me time. Well, I, I mean, let's go back to the IDE as a point, and, and then I'll stop harboring on this topic. But, uh, you know, I mean, if we're talking about like JavaScript as an example, because that was one that he just mentioned. Uh, I mean, WebStorm, I love WebStorm. It's amazing. That is an awesome IDE. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I actually like it for doing my JavaScript over Visual Studio. So, you know, I mean, there's you could stay in a Node.js environment and still have an awesome IDE. Oh, uh, going back to real quick, when would you not use .NET? So we mentioned Java, .NET, mostly kind of the same. But I mean, in terms of what they offer. Okay, you're probably going to get some some. It might get a little bit of flamey on there. But, yeah. but so what we talked about the meetup that we went to with Elixir on top of Phoenix, right? Like if you need reliability. Uh, so what? It's the other way around. Or other Phoenix way around. on top of Elixir. Yeah. So reliability might be one reason, right? Like uptime could be one to where you choose a different framework. Another one could be parallelism. Like that's there actually some a great point. So I'm um, sorry to interrupt, but uh, you know, the guy, the guy who was doing the presentation uh, worked for a company that um, you could say that they were doing they weren't doing telecommunications, but they were definitely doing networking communications, and uh, they were basing. Uh, some of their core technologies off of Erlang as well because they wanted the the uptime, you know, the ridiculous number of nines for liability that uh, Erlang m- makes its claim for. Yep, and then there's also uh, other languages that are fantastic at parallelizing tasks. So if you need a lot of concurrent processing or something like that, so so there are other reasons other than just I, I guess what I was getting at is there might be other real. Um, performance or reliability reasons where you might choose a different platform over a .NET or a Java Functional or a PHP. Functional reasons, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So that that's another thing to yeah, think about. Yeah, because when you talk about like the, the 
how did you word it? The threading, uh, uh, like concurrent parallelism, computing, yeah, whatever. Like that's that's uh, Ghost. Go big, is um, big on that. Yep. Like, I won't call it a claim to fame, but whatever. You know, yep. one of, one of the things it's touted for. Yep. So those are, those are some of the things to keep in mind. Yeah, like for example, I don't really care for JavaScript. Uh, you know, I like the structure and I like the the benefits that go along with static typing. However, ninety percent of my side projects is are my side projects are in JavaScript because I can do something simple like GitHub pages to be able to share my work with other people. And I don't need a server. I don't need to set up a website. I don't need to upload anything. I just kind of do my Git stuff on command line and I'm able to send a link to somebody at the end. So that's a huge benefit. That and you love JavaScript. All right. So uh, <laughs> um, also we, we have here in the notes that when it comes to writing ASP, there's two major sides to it. HTML templating, Razor, .liquid, and you have your compiled language, your C-sharp, your VB, F-sharp, any .NET language that gets compiled down. It, the funny part, though, is where we mentioned the HTML templating with the Razor and all that, I feel like that's somewhat going away with all the front-end frameworks now. Like, Razor used to be a huge deal in the MVC world, right? Because that was your view, right? Nowadays, yeah, it it's almost like... It is, though. If you're, like, truly in... If you're doing only an MVC app, but a lot of people are going towards Angular or React or... Yeah, see, that's the thing. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. So when you get to your single-page apps, your spas, as you they are... You might use C-sharp on the server side, but you're not it. using it on the on the front yep. end. It's your middleware. On the client side. It's really your middleware. It's what everybody calls your middleware, and yeah. that's what .NET becomes at that point, and then you have your client stuff, and then your, your storage, right? So... Oh. Yeah, five years ago, if I asked someone what template you used, uh, they would have talked about Razor or, or one of these alternatives. Uh, now, if I ask what template someone uses, they're like, "Oh, you mean like handlebars or mustache?" Or right. you know, that stuff has really kind of moved over to the client. And uh, I like uh, MVC because it kind of uh, it caters to that a little bit more and it lets me have that flexibility. So I like that I don't have to spend too much time in uh, in template land if I don't want to. Hmm. I, I like the, but front that's end. only part of it. Yeah, I mean, it you is. can totally, you don't need to have any razor. You don't need to have any sort of templating or any sort of HTML all, at all in your uh, C Sharp project for our ASP.NET project. You can do everything via web services and, and interact with JavaScript. And, uh, and that's because there's a, a whole other side to this, which is basically the compiled part where you can do stuff like C Sharp, Visual Basic, F Sharp, uh, any, any of the things that compile down to uh, the .NET uh, intermediary language. All right, so I guess now it's time to sort of talk about what we were, what we're here today for, and that's <laughs> the uh, the caching, right? So we've we've kind of lit up. We we talked about the hardware in the previous episode, and that was kind of to get you warmed up to the idea that there's this thing that exists in everything that we do that we don't even think about, right? Like we kind of get it for free because Intel was smart enough to do it, and now we're application programmers. We need our programs to be faster. We need to think about the same things that the people did on the hardware side, except now we've got to do it at multiple layers. And so we want to talk about what it's like to actually cache in an application. Um, and we've got in the .NET framework, and this is this is kind of more, the more traditional way of doing the .NET stuff, and we're going to hit on some of the other like MVC type approaches to things as well. But there's a few types of caching that they give you. The application cache, the page output cache, and then the attribute caching is more the MVC type route. And there are tons of things that go on as far as caching anytime you're doing anything. So you've got the GAC, NuGet, um, all kinds of things, even the browser. But we are focusing on .NET. ASP.NET. ASP.NET, good point. All right. So yeah. what are the benefits? Yeah, uh, specific to caching in your web uh, web application framework of choice, um, the, the kinds of things you get uh, here are basically um, reduce, reducing database and service calls. And uh, that also means reducing the load on those uh, servers as well. So you need less of them and uh, a lot of less headaches there. It reduces the overall network traffic, which is nice, and uh, improve uh, improves performance. And as we mentioned before, uh, improving performance isn't always a matter of milliseconds. It's a matter of uh, being able to do something or not sometimes. Okay, so here here's a thought. Um, going back to last episode, right? The number one takeaway that we had from uh, going through that and going through all the numbers, and you know, like uh, especially when we started uh, putting those numbers into uh, numbers that humans could actually understand, right? Was that the closer you were, then the faster it was, right? Like that was the, you know, so 
And, and even going back to our How to Be a Programmer series, I believe it was, where we talked about you know your biggest bang for buck is going to be if you have to do any kind of refactoring or you know for performance reasons, right? If you're trying to like attack something to make it perform better, your biggest bang for buck where you're going to see the most value in your time is going to be to go after those things that are um, you know that are making network calls, right? Where you're you know where the distance is great, right? It, it's further away from you, right? And the same principle here, uh, you know, is going to apply here, right? That that from from the last episode is that you know if you can keep that cache. Uh, that data closest to you without having to go outside of your system to another system, then you, you can gain uh, you know, performance, uh, uh, you know, see an, a performance improvement from that. So one thing I do want to clarify here, though, is we say reduce network traffic. That's if you're storing in memory or on disk on the server. This there, is true. There are other types of caching mechanisms now that a lot of, a lot of companies use, especially when you have a large server farm, where you might be using a Redis cache or some sort of distributed caching mechanism. So the goal is there is to reduce the CPU processing to get these things, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I did want to touch on that real quick before we jump too far ahead. So what's the cons then? Why would I not want to cache? Because so far it sounds amazing. Right, you tell me. Well, it's kind of annoying. Okay, (laughs) so it's annoying. So, so uh, there's the real possibility of having stale data. And how do you know if the data is stale? When you decide that the data is stale, like um, we'll get to in a, you know an upcoming ex- episode. You know, we hope to talk about caching algorithms. But uh, deciding when to invalidate something from the cache, I believe that was like one of the the, the two hardest things um, that that for a programmer. Right, one of them was you know right invalidating the cache. Uh, the second naming one was things. naming things, and the third one was off by one errors, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. So, so the very real possibility of stale data and how to deal with that, right, and how to know that that's one con, right? Then there's the complexity, right? There's the complexity of not only dealing with you know the knowing of the stale data, but then the complexity of the whole caching uh, mechanism, you know, whether you use something built in or if you decide to roll your own. Or if you decide to use a third party uh, that you have to integrate, like what Alan was suggesting, um, that may not be uh, you know, physically on the same box, so you might have to make a network connection. But hopefully, you know it's a closer network connection or, or faster because it's only dealing with uh, you know key lookup values or something like that, right? But there's still the additional complexity that you have to uh, add to your system, and then you also need to make sure too. That depending on how that's implemented, that 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 then becomes the single source of truth, so that all of your calls for whatever that piece of data is, um, they're all going through that same funnel, so that you know they can all show it. Because the last thing that you want to have happen is you know ninety percent of the calls use this cached value, and then this one other guy over here, you know, just goes off and and requeries the data on its own and is always pulling up a live view or something of the data, but never, you know, taking advantage of that cache. Right. And then, you know, what happens if it's, you know, if the two are out of sync, right. So yeah, complexity. Yeah. Even adding to that, if you've got more than one server, right now you have to start thinking about things. And so you can't just necessarily do in memory caching because, you know, this server has one thing in its cache, this server has another. So then you have to start thinking about a distributed cache or, or do you care if that's, you know, this goes back to, you know, what is truly stale data? Like, do you care if they're out of sync? Like, there's so many questions that you have to answer. Or or maybe uh, maybe you don't care that each server has its own in-memory cache, but in that case, now you got to think, okay, well, I have to set up, like, sticky sessions, mm-hmm. right? Like, yeah, there, there's, there's a whole level of, uh, you know, complexity that you got to think about if you're going to start adding in cache into your system and where you're going to add that in, right? Yep. So if it's... Uh, you know, further away from the client, then you know there might be more touch points that you have to think about. Yeah, one other con I just thought of: um, if you're the person that sets up the caching, and you are the person now that is the front line for problems, because the first thing anyone does is, if there's any sort of cache involved, is point to the cache person. <laughs> like, I don't know, man, that's cached. I don't, you know, talk, talked out law. That's right. 
He, he wrote it. Problem. <laughs> we can't even look at it, man. That is that is foreign code. <laughs> I feel like I feel like you just threw a dagger at me. Thanks. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> All right. So, but it's not. But it's not. But he's not lying. Though. No, it's true. Absolutely, because people are like, oh, but we know that data is there. Oh, it must be a caching problem. Like, and, and it really is a complex problem for that very reason. Like, everybody has a different idea about what they want to see. Oh. I totally forgot a con about uh, about cash is that you should absolutely not use it <laughs> because <laughs> carry a credit card, man. Is because it? here's the thing, yeah, cash is king. Because <laughs> here's the thing that I forgot about too, and just Joe reminded me when he when he made his his joking comment about everybody's going to go to the cash guy. Because n- not only is like if you are the guy that happened to implement that, and like it doesn't even have to be you didn't have to roll your own. You could just be using the built-in stuff. But every time there's a problem, they're gonna they're gonna it's gonna be blamed on the cache. Absolutely. <laughs> Even though it's not, they're yeah. gonna blame the cache. Like, oh, that must be a caching problem. So you know what? I take it back. Don't use cache. <laughs> Don't use it. It'll make your life so much simpler. All right, ignore what he just said. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna tell you why you should use it in different ways you can. Um, we we already told you why, right? It just speeds things up. It, it does come with problems. So one of the first things we want to talk about is the application cache, and this one's actually pretty simple because it's just key value pairs so basically when you get into this thing um if you cache some piece of data you give it a name right like um i don't know number user id yeah user id right so that's it whatever value is in that cache is that one and until you clear it out it's going to continue to use that one if you try and assign to that it will overwrite the cache It'll refresh it. So it's it's such a simple one. It's it's your basic dictionary or your hash table. That's really all it is. It couldn't get any easier. And yeah, I'm trying to think like what it might look like if it wasn't a key value pair like that. Um hmm. but okay. Could I be won't a put you on the spot. List. Say what? I don't know, an array. I don't know. I was just well, talking are you talking about like what's being sources. cached or well, just I the mean, overall cache back? I mean, that's a terrible way of doing it. Uh, I was just trying to think about an alternative approach. Yeah, I mean, it really, a lot, of, a lot of things all kind of boil down to that to some degree, just about right. Because you have to be able to reference what's in the cache. Um, there are other methods that we'll talk about here shortly that kind of get into some of it, but it, that's just your simplest type way to store value, to cache the value, to refresh the value, whatever. Um, yeah. Well, it's also the fastest, right? Hash tables uh, have a you know a big O lookup time of uh, you know, O of one. It's constant time to look something up. So if you've got the name for it, bang, that's the way to go. You don't want to be traversing a tree or looping through an array to try and look something up. You know, it just doesn't make sense if you can just kind of stick it in there and look it up immediately. Yeah. Yep. And we had some good uses here. Uh, for for caching uh, for for the key value pair type stuff. So like looking up your common site settings, right? That might be one. Well, I decided not yeah. to use cash at all, but <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, I mean, don't even think about don't think about cash. Just for a minute now, think about it like variables. Like if you've got say a web config file, every time you a- uh, access it, and that's a basically a config file that's um, where you store common settings on on disk, and then your application can look that stuff up. So if you need to make some changes to this file, you don't have to redeploy your whole app. It's um, it's a a common convention in many applications, and uh, as we talked about in the twelve factor app, a, a lot of times you can do this in like environment v- environment variables or other places. But anyway, point is, your web application framework will load these settings once or periodically, and so every time you reference one of these settings, it's not going and doing that slow uh, file system lookup. It's reading that stuff out of memory because it knows that those settings are going to be accessed often. So that's a great use for um, for Kind of a different kind of caching, but same same idea. Basically, you've got something that's slow, but you stick it in memory where it's going to be uh, fast and cheap. Yep. Well, here's another one that uh, you know anybody can relate to, regardless of of technology stack, would be uh, database connection pools, right? Uh, and depending on what technology stack you're using, you might get that uh, built in for you a little bit more than others. Yep. Uh, another great example is uh, user information. 
Like, for example, um, it's I, I think it's common if you're doing any sort of like website work to want to know what the person's uh, name and email address is. You may need that for all sorts of reasons. You might want to say, a, hello, Joe, in the top left. You might want to uh, send me an email on some sort of action. You might want to access my user ID uh, based on my cookie for all sorts of reasons. So these are the kind of things that make sense to look up, say, at the beginning of a request or the beginning of a session and cache that stuff for faster lookup because you know in the, the life cycle of me using your application that you're gonna need to access that data hundreds of times. And that's not stuff you wanna look up from the database hundreds of times. Yeah, and in that example, right? Because this is, we're talking about from a server point of view, caching this thing. So like the user info, the key might be user ID, and then the value might actually be an object containing all your information, right? Like your first name, your last name, last time you logged in, that kind of stuff, right? So key value pair doesn't necessarily mean that it's just, you know, first name is this, last name is that, because this is a shared cache. So it wouldn't make sense to have just a user ID or, or user ID key in there. So having an actual ID with an object um, type in there is the type of stuff that you can do with that. Well, you know, we keep talking about, uh, I don't know if we wanted to get into like some of the actual implementations that you might use or not, but, you know, we keep talking about this in the frame of, uh, you know, the conversation has been framed as you know, web server. Uh, you know, we, we keep kind of talking about it like that, but you know, th there's caching mechanisms built in, not to ASP.NET, but if we're just talking about like general.NET, there's caching mechanisms mechanisms that are built in to just the core language mm -hmm. that you can use as well. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if we wanted to go over some of these, um, you know, but we can. Uh, I, I mean, like for example. So we were talking about the, um, you know, in the web server, uh, or, or as Vlad would say, web server, <laughs> um, uh, you know, kind of conversation. Then there's two ways that you could do this, right? Like if you wanted things to stay cached, um, you know, across your server, um, you know, across, across request for, you know, for multiple requests, right? Then there's the HTTP runtime uh, dot cache property, right? which um, I forget that guy was like an implementation of uh, system.web.caching, right? But there's a generic version of the same thing for uh, like you know, desktop application uh, as well. That's system.runtime.caching uh, object cache class. And both of them, you know, like what you said, Alan, you, you could do your, your key value pair kind of... Um, uh, you know, how would I say this? Lookup or cache? Storing. Without saying yeah. cache. Storage. Storing look up. There you go. Yep. Storage. I like that word better. Uh, you're saying your key value pair storage. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but if you wanted it to stay, if you wanted to cache something within a specific request, right, and stay within the request, then one thing that you could use is use the HTTP context.items. Uh, property, and so you know you could stay at the at the request level for that. So maybe you've already taken the time to look up some stuff for this particular user, and you got a lot of other calls that you need to do, and you don't want to have to look that up again, but you want it to be available. Then you can use that guy, right? Yeah, very cool. Yeah, we didn't really even talk about the different kinds of um, life cycles that are, are um, or rather scopes that are uh, there. We don't want to get too deep into the framework, but when uh, Outlaw's talking about requests, he's talking about an actual HTTP request issued by your browser. Like you say, go to www.codingblocks.net slash episode 46, and um, that's a request. Your browser uh, is going to send me the, re the request for that website and uh, that web page. And um, WordPress in the background is going to uh, go through a request lifecycle, gather up all the data that it needs uh, from various caches because you know WordPress is caching the crap out of stuff. And uh, it's going to put that stuff together. But also uh, web frameworks, including, web, um, including WordPress and PHP in general, have a notion of a session as well, which is basically um, uh, it's a uh, – how do you describe session? It's um, – it's just a way to tie uh, different requests together, right? To make it look like it's yes. the same user. It, yep. So groups that stuff together. So like, it's not going to try and authorize your username and password every time you request a single web page, right? It's going to give you some sort of cookie that ties those requests together, and it's going to be valid for a certain amount of time, or um, it, or it will time out after a certain period of inactivity. 
And you know, that brings up a good point. I never really thought about session as a cash, but it kind of is, right? I mean, people use it as a cash a lot of times, and you can get a lot of memory uh, pressure because of that. But that is one way that it's done. And then you also have your application cache, which are variables that are shared by everyone that uses it, right? Like the application name could be coding blocks. And then everybody who accesses that variable gets that same thing. Or like a connection string for your main database. That's something that doesn't normally change during the uh, the lifetime of your application unless you're doing some really funky, cool stuff. But that's something that can kind of be picked up once and unless you restart that application, no need to keep checking for it. And so we cache that at the application level. Um, so that's something that's common to all, all web frameworks and is common to caching as well, but it's, it's, it's all the same principle. We keep a subset of the, our information in a closed location. So we don't need to hit the database server or the NoSQL server or whatever else we're doing. It, we don't have to keep hitting APIs for information if we can just kind of keep that stuff around for a, a known amount of time. Yep. All right. So now we're going to get into another part of the framework, which is the, the ASP.NET framework. And this is the page output cache. And I, I've heard this called different things in Java as well, but the page output cache in .NET is basically you make a request to a web page. The first time it serves it up, that, that page, the, the server goes through, creates the page. It will then save that in cache. So the next time, like I hit page one, um, it gets built and it gets sent back to me. But then they put it in the cache. The next time Outlaw goes and hits page one, then it's not going to go try and rebuild that page again. It's going to go straight to the cache and pull it out. And then if Joe hits it after that, then he's also going to get that cached thing. Now, the problem is, when does that go stale? You know, again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that whole notion is fairly easy uh, to understand, right? Like the first person that hits it, it does the work. Then everybody else after that gets the benefits of that first hit. And that is the whole page by the way. So the entire page, top to bottom, every bit of content that's in it, that's the page output cache. So the first time it's created, even if there's a date that was written on that page, if if you weren't smart enough to omit that from part of it, then that same date is going to get served up every single time. Assuming that it's not JavaScript, we're talking about all server-side generated stuff here. So you probably want this to be something that's going to be um, the same among users then. That's what yes. you're getting at. Yes. So, like, for example, if you wanted to um, cache your sitemap, or, or better yet, well, um, I th- when I said sitemap, though, I immediately thought of, like, a Google sitemap, but I was originally thinking of, like, maybe a visual representation that you might show to the users, but I suppose you could do either if you wanted. Yep. Uh, I mean, even a, a good example is, uh, like, even our podcast, right? Like, every podcast that you see in iTunes has a podcast feed. It's just a huge XML file, right, that goes through. So that's maybe something that if somebody hits that page, you want to cache it. You don't want to regenerate that thing because it could be expensive. It's having to crawl through your database, get all the metadata, all that kind of stuff. So the first time you hit that thing, you want that thing cached so that the next 100 people that hit it, it's the same thing that's being served up from memory. And it's not having to go through all the CPU intensive stuff to recreate that. And it's PHP. And I heard that Joe was willing to do some PHP. So (laughs) I feel like that's a win. Yep. Look, could you imagine if we uh, re if we rebounced the episode every time someone requested it, or every time someone requested it, we uh, all got together and uh, recorded it again. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're calling the file itself as a cache, right. a cache of this no. this uh, this meeting. So, yeah, so reducing redundant work. Yeah, I mean that's really what it is. Now, one of the interesting things about the ASP.NET page output cache is it will cache not just the the URL that's it, but it'll also do it based off like a uh, user agent. So if you call it from uh, an iPhone, it can cache that one individually. So everybody else that comes from an iPhone, they'll see that same version. Uh, you could cache it for Android. You could cache it for Chrome, Firefox, whatever. So you have the option in the ASP.NET page output cache to define the level of granularity for how you want to do it. So you could do it at the URL, or you could also add in the other things like the user agents and all that. Um, I, I kind of wanted to take it in different directions, so I, I don't know if you want to go ahead and go ahead. Well, w- the one last thing I was going to say, though, is that uh, it does, going back to the conversation of, um, uh, how well, how is it worded? Something about when we brought up Razor and uh, um, we were talking about the, the, the templating, though. It kind of feels dated, though, because it's like, man, nobody's, you're not, is anyone really writing their 
<laughs> you know, using this this output page cache, you know, using something other than like an Angular or a React or something like that for the front end to where like oh, this dude. is even relevant anymore, like that part. No, nah, man, that's the spa tyranny that's oppressing your mindset. Spa <laughs> is not the only way. We built websites for a long time before SPA was a stupid acronym, <laughs> and we will be here building pages. I will be here building pages long after SPA is gone. Preach on, yeah. Grandpa Joe. All right. Yeah, man. <laughs> the, there are I so many like times start when I don't handle. need an app. Grandpa oh, man, there's a Joe. movement. I'm gonna, <laughs> hold movement, on. Let me get man. your new Twitter handle <laughs> it's a real movement. quick. Uh, Yo, I, awesome. I'm the crust of this wave. Oh, man, that's amazing. Oh, hey, before we move on from this, there's also, so that was the entire page output cache. So now this is going back to more of the web formsy way of doing things in ASP.NET, but it's this worth... Is even more, you know, even older. Yeah, this is good. This is going back to Grandpa Underwood a little bit. Um, <laughs> so there was also the notion of in, in web forms, you could create user controls, right? And those were basically components that you could drop in various different other pages 10 times, 50 times, whatever you wanted to do. You could also cache those things individually as well. So let's say that you had a page that you wanted to display and most of it was static, but then there were other pieces of components that you either wanted to turn the cache off for so it was always fresh, you could do that. Or if you the whole page wasn't um, cacheable, but that one component was, you could also do that. So you could actually get the benefits of caching just parts of a page as opposed to the entire page itself, which can be useful. Like it going back to that whole time thing, right? Like let's say that you return the server time. That's not something you want cached because that changes every second, right? So maybe you had a component that displayed, you know, hi, Joe, it is now, you know, 5.30 p.m. your time. <laughs> then that's not going to be Welcome to my 1995 webpage. <laughs> that's right. And ignore the spa thing. But going back to it, so that spa thing, so let's say your application is that way, but you still might have things like like what a robots.txt type file, something that you might actually generate on the fly. We've done things with e-commerce sites to where you have to create like product graphs, right? So that's the kind of stuff that you don't necessarily want being built on the fly every time because that's CPU intensive stuff. And it's also a database hit, right? Like you have a hundred thousand products in your catalog. You don't want to be creating a page with a hundred thousand line items that are being, you know, have a bunch of metadata created the entire time. So, so there's still a place for caches like this. It may not be in your pretty spa. That's only going to load one page and have, you know, 500 JavaScript includes, but there are definitely times that you'd want to use this output cache mechanism. Yeah, and actually, you just reminded me of the best kind of cache, static site generators. I'm looking at, at codingblocks.net right now. Our comments are dynamic. We need those to be you know, shown. People can add stuff. We want that to be interactive. We've got some tweets on the right. Nothing else changes on an hourly or even daily basis. I mean, this, this stuff just doesn't happen. If we took these requests every you know just uh you know issued some standard requests and, and went through each article we could totally generate static files save them to disk if not memory and then every time we uh, we get someone visiting the site we just serve up the single file so now instead of hitting the database server hitting the various services hitting the api running through logic we're just loading a file off disk and sending it right back which by the I, way we kind of do that anyways but Yep. Well, that's not it's exactly great. fair though, because there's the search. Oh, that, we do have a search. It doesn't work like what that would not support what Joe is just describing. But yeah, if we didn't have that, I'm with you though. Yeah. Who uses site searches, man? Google. Man, I actually do believe it or not. I search on our site sometimes. Um, you know, because we have lots of great Alan's, content. I, I go and search. <laughs> Alan said something crazy, and I had to look it up to prove him wrong. <laughs> oh, wait, no, I was wrong. Ah, uh, man. <laughs> the internet's broken. Uh, I can't trust yeah. this thing. But it's a great example. If you have like an e-commerce site or some somewhere that you're getting hammered, if you even if you show something like inventory, right, that does change minute by minute, there's no reason why you can't generate the static parts of your site, save them to file, um, and uh, just display those pages and kind of pop in those those places that do need to change with JavaScript or something like that. So that's a great way to really reduce your um, CPU on both your application server and your database. And so that's a, a really extreme example, but it's a good one. Yep. 
Uh, and that kind of brings up another point, though, that was that was key here, and I, we probably haven't mentioned somewhere in the show notes down below, but there's different types of caching. You don't just necessarily cache to memory. You can also cache to disk. You can cache to a database. You can cache to multiple different places, right? So what you just said, you could literally generate that page and save it on disk because it's still faster to go get it off the disk than it is to query the database process all the stuff right out there. Oh, you HTML. forgot to make your connection to the database and first. You, you open your connection. The overhead of getting that connection. Yep. So, I mean, even then, it, it's all about reducing the steps and how warm it needs to be or how fast you need to be able to get to it. So, um, it, with that, the next pieces that we had here were like the, the time that you can cache. So, you can cache. You can say, hey, I just want this cache for an hour, Right. And no matter what happens in the hour, it's going to end, and then it'll have to be recreated. Well, were you talking about? Because I saw this in the notes, and I thought like you were specific to your page output cache. Still, this is the page output cache. Okay. Yep. So you can you can cache that for a specific period of time, or like we already mentioned, the browser versions, or uh, you know, locale uh, information like language, for yep. example. Yep. All right. And well, you can also well, you know something. Go ahead. Uh, I was, uh, yeah. So um, one thing that's kind of cool about uh, ASP.NET and probably other web application frameworks as well is um, things like a settings file like we kind of mentioned earlier. Um, those are the kind of things that are, are loaded when the application loads and aren't typically loaded again because why would you? However, uh, ASP.NET and probably other web application frameworks do watch those files. So if you make a change to uh, like a, a config file or a web config file that it's aware of, then it's going to reload itself. And so it feels like those settings are real time, but they're really not. It just happens to know when it changes. And so it's able to restart the application, which is really slick. And that kind of leads to the last part of the, the page output cache is you can evict cache entries based on events. And that event might be exactly what you just said, right? Like a, a config file changed on the disk or, you know, some other file changed or a database entry changed. Oh, the worst. Uh, ASP.NET by default every 29 hours will recycle. I really? I have uh, had problems with this. Uh, yeah, it's really weird and it seems it's off because it'll happen that? at different points. No. Yeah, man. It's caused me We've some heartache because totally you want to know. The, with three of us, it totally hit this before. 29 hours? That That's so random. I should remember it. I don't at all. Holy smokes. Wow, that's that's terrible. Apparently, anyway, it it's didn't not burn into your memory the that. same way. No. That's actually an yeah. IIS thing, though. It is, and uh, that's not a requirement for ASP.NET anymore. Oh, really? Yep. So, so .NET Core is better? Oh, yeah. Well, it wasn't that it was a requirement before. It was just an IIS default. Just what they did. Yeah, that's but crazy. who on earth was running ASP.NET through anything else but IIS? Besides yeah. Vlad. Nobody did. Right? <laughs> Vlad was. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's a good point. But, uh, yeah. Well, because at the time, there wasn't another option. Yeah. Except for Vlad's, which I'm about to uh, mention as soon as I find it. Oh, well, yeah. What was the name of the web server? Oh, crap. Well, Vlad Reebok. I can find it real quick. It's it, like, oh, come on, man. Here, here, everyone can listen to us all Google. This is where it Who goes has off the, the rails. Who uh, Googling Google's <laughs> web server? Uh, I'm going to Google for, I am Vlad, I write web server. Oh, come on. Where is it, man? This is going to drive me crazy. Well, we were terrible. Oh, well, I guess we'll have it in the show notes, but I feel bad, man. He's uh, He really wrote a really awesome web server that's used by, like, what, a million people? Ulti and, Dev. Uh, yep, okay, that was Ulti it. Dev. That's it. Yep. So, yeah. It, he he actually is one of the few people that didn't use IIS. <laughs> UltiDev.com. Yep. So, all right. So, the next thing is uh, method level caching. Joe, you want to fill us in on this one? Yeah, and this is something that's specific to uh, MVC and uh, Web API, and they've kind of combined now, so I won't even bore you guys with the details. But what I really like about it is that you can annotate these things, which is something you can do in uh, static languages, where you basically, in, in C Sharp anyway, you put some brackets above, and you can kind of provide some special instructions like caching. And so you could have some brackets and then specify like a cache period or a particular type of caching or um, just all sorts of information that uh, makes it easy to cache stuff. So, for example, um, I have a, a website that does some color calculations. It's really boring. I won't bore you with details, but I get a lot of the same requests, like people comparing, say, red to blue over and over and over again. I don't want to do that work all the time, so I put some um, 
some caching in place. And so if you keep requesting the same information over and over and over again, it actually sees the two inputs coming in, uses that as the key for the cache, and then it doesn't have to redo those calculations and it saves itself a lot of time because people do, for some reason, do a lot of re repeat calculations. Hmm. So this is actually not at all specific to um, ASP.NET, though. So uh, we've talked about aspect-oriented programming before and how yeah. awesome it is, right? So if you uh, use PostSharp, for example, they actually provide a really nice example um, in their documentation about how you can do uh, cache the results of a method um, and you can, you know, you, you would decorate your method with an attribute, um, as, as you described, and, uh, you know, you can just use an aspect to do it. So, so there is the .NET way that you described, but then there's a, you know, this aspect oriented version of it as well. And, you know, other aspect oriented frameworks might allow you to do a similar thing regardless of language, right? So, you know, we're calling it an attribute in .NET, but it'd be an annotation in Java, um, you know, so maybe, uh, you know, your language of choice might, you know, for aspect oriented programming might give you, uh, a way to do this. And I'll include a link to that as well. Cause it's really cool. Cool. Um, also a, a couple things that looks like some of the show notes got a little bit out of order here, but on the page caching thing, there were actually two different types. There's control caching and fragment caching. Um, and this goes back to the user control type stuff. And then there's also the post cache substitution, which I thought was pretty interesting. So you can cache the whole page, but pieces of the page are substitutable. So it, it's kind of weird. It, instead of everything happening in line, like after the page is built, then it'll go and swap in content. So that's pretty interesting. And then the other thing to be aware of is you can do it on a page by page basis, like in the in the definition of the page itself. Or you can go into like the web config and you can do like entire files or directories in bulk in there. So it's easier to set up. So there are multiple ways to do that kind of thing. And that pretty much wraps up with the, uh, the page level caching. All right. So, all right. So I, I lost my place for a moment, but so we're done with that part. So, you know what? I'm going to just go ahead and say this, okay? This episode is sponsored by... Well, it could be you. <laughs> so, so if, if you would like to be a sponsor of this podcast, contact us. Oh, you know what? I didn't. Would which and mail did we want to give out for that? Uh, just send it to comments at codyblocks.net. Okay. Or if you want, you can go up to the contact us page at codyblocks.net slash contact. Either which way, uh, just you know, reach out to us, and we will definitely get back to you. Yep, and you could be. You could hear your company's lovely name mentioned by one of our voices that all sound the same so you're pretty much getting a deal because it's gonna be a win-win no matter who says it that's right i'm the fast yeah. talker <laughs> and you can request which one of us by the way so yeah you can get uh, mr california slash southern you can get mr fast or you can get egon <laughs> <laughs> if only you could see him doing that that was amazing <laughs> uh, please ask yeah, punch I I feel like I got to ask who you going to call. Ghost. Better banner. banner. Uh, <laughs> you went too far. The too hot to handle, enough. too cold to hold. Oh, man. Yes, you did. That's amazing. What's up? <laughs> As I choke over here. Thanks. Oh, that's awesome. Cool. All right. So, so I also want to say this that if you haven't um, noticed by now, we're a little needy. <laughs> and we really. We really would like you to tell us that we're pretty and that you like us by heading over to uh, www.codingblocks.net slash review, and you can find links to either iTunes or Stitcher, and leave us a review if you haven't already. We we greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I don't know what more I can say about it other than, you know, it, it really does make our day when we read a new review, and you'd really be doing us a favor because, uh, you know, it, it helps us out. And hey, and after you write the review, come join us on Slack by <laughs> heading to www.codingblocks.net slash Slack and plug in your information and come join in on, on the conversations over there. We have some great ones daily. So, so um, you know, while we're taking this little break here, 
last time we gave out a survey and it's time for my favorite portion of the show is to see like, well, how right or wrong are you two? <laughs> um, you, which you're not really having a good track record. I'll be honest. So <laughs> I was within one tenth of a percent one time. One time, but you were still wrong because That's you didn't shut. You didn't trust your gut, oh. and you then went and changed it. And so your final answer was way far away. But I was so close. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, so the question in the last episode was: If you were stranded on an island and could have only one programming book, which would it be? Okay. Now, somebody had fun with the. Uh, you know, filling out this survey because there was no shortage of books here. So I'm going to burn through these real quick, okay? So here are your choices. Code Complete, a practical guide, or, I'm sorry, a practical handbook of software construction. Clean Code, a handbook of agile software craftsmanship. This is the third one. Structure and interpretation of computer programs. Number four, design patterns, elements of reusable object-oriented software. Number five, Head first design patterns. Six refactoring, improving the design of existing code. Seven effective, ah, working effectively with legacy code. Eight introduction to algorithms. Nine the pragmatic programmer. Ten cracking the coding interview. Eleven the art of unit testing. Twelve the art of computer programming. All volumes. Thirteen the practice of programming. Fourteen clean coder. A code of conduct for professional programmers. I think I'm on fifteen. Oh. How to survive on a desert island 16 rapid development and 17 adaptive code via c sharp that's because i put an other in there people could type in okay. their own options okay yeah oh which one where did that start then i don't have any clue which ones they had okay <laughs> oh, okay so that's why there were so many yeah that so is. many choices then yeah i, I wanted I people like, wow, to be able to really... throw in their own books right you really went far and then and then okay that now explains the one why it was specific to c sharp because i was like Wow, why would you? you really? Okay. <laughs> well, I because there were no other ones specific to any other language. That's why I was curious. Well, I left it open because I figured that was a good way for us to find out like some good books that maybe no, we hadn't heard of, right? So, yeah, sure. Um, so it, on that because the list is so great and people could type in their own thing. I'm going to think design patterns one. Okay, design patterns. That's your number one pick. Yeah. Care to put a number behind it? Man, that's going to be so hard. There were so many choices. I'm going to say ten percent. Ten percent. All right, number one, design patterns. Joe, what say you? 15% for, it's between two, but I'm, I'm mm, program, 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 pro, Easy for pragmatic you, so. program. Uh, <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. Okay, <laughs> so, so Joe thinks that the number one book choice to be left with on a, while you're stranded on a desert island is the pragmatic programmer at 15%, and Alan's pick is design patterns, elements of reusable object-oriented software at 10%. Of course you're both wrong. I mean, how did you not see code that coming? Code complete, code complete. How did you not see that coming? The number one choice is, of Think course, code. code complete, a practical handbook of software construction no. at 22% of the vote. Wow. It had a what? commanding lead. Yeah. It was actually really impressive. All wow. Right. And then... And then you know, just because why not? Uh, you know, let's go through number two and three. The art of computer programming, all volumes with a fifteen percent. No. Uh, you know, second place. Wow. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Joe, third place, the pragmatic programmer. Yeah. Nobody cares about design patterns. We've been doing it wrong. Yep. Twelve. Twelve <laughs> percent, man. Wow. Yeah, well, you you were at eight, so you uh -huh. weren't too far off okay. on your percent. You're both, you know, pretty close on your percentages there, but uh, yeah, you you weren't. And and design patterns wasn't even like, I mean, it might have been like tied, you know, later, but it was it definitely wasn't top three as I already said. I think yeah. it was tied for fourth, so maybe it wasn't too far. Where's clean yeah. code? Clean code was the top one. No, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Code, code complete. complete. Code complete clean, was. Clean code was the one tied with the design patterns. Okay, so okay. number four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I can so. live with that. Excellent. Yeah. So, and you know what? Hey, let's do a survey for next time while we're talking about surveys. So the idea for this one was, let's talk about your favorite source of caffeine, <laughs> right? Because over the years, I've definitely heard people argue about like I've always been a Dr. Pepper fan over like a Mountain Dew or a Jolt, right? But of course, 
in this day and age of Starbucks, everybody loves uh, you know coffee and espressos and cappuccinos and cold coffees. Care to, you, do you do you want to like taint the jury pool? Throw mm. out your favorite. Dude, I love Mountain Dew. No, I'm stopping you right there. You can't do it. Mountain Dew. Oh, man. <laughs> you cheated. It's good. Red Bull, to too. That. Man, uh, I, am, I have had my first cold brew coffee thanks to Slack, and uh, it was really good. So uh, I'm going to have to have a few hundred more before I can really enter it as a true competitor, but I, I would be interested to, to hear what you guys have to say. I'm curious how, how did the Slack conversation come into this? Uh, we have a beverages channel. I, I believe it's called Alco Dash Code. Well, okay, oh, code. I've seen that, but I wouldn't assume that cold coffee would be a conversation <laughs> that would come up in that. Um, you would be wrong, sir. Apparently, <laughs> apparently, I am. Uh, man, a few hundred. That's only that's only like a grand at Starbucks. Just so you know. Oh, <laughs> well, no, wait. Like one fifteenth of them are free. So, you know, <laughs> nine nine seventy five or something. Hey, one fifteen. Oh, speaking of, here's here's a stat for you, it, and it's not a real stat, um, but a pseudo stat for you. I had read somewhere that Starbucks, like they're, you know, you can charge up your reward card or whatever. There's more money in reserves on those things than most companies make in a year. Really? Mm-hmm. It is insane. Oh, okay, so that's basically like saying that people have money tied up in gift cards. Yes. Is the equivalent. Yep. Yeah. Right. So I definitely put like 15 bucks on my phone every, I don't know, two weeks or so. It, it's amazing. 15? Like They've got a lot of money up there. Hmm. No, are you not but, getting breakfast? Come on, no, man. Dude, 15. I, no, that's dude. That's not going to get you nothing. I don't I don't get the breakfast until I get my rewards points because then I get that sandwich for free. I can't pay four dollars for a breakfast sandwich. I can't do it. Now is that so okay, so the reason why you put the money on there is for the rewards. That's the then, only reason. Yeah, okay. And it's convenient, right? Like I don't have to break out my wallet or anything. Because the like one that. near me, finally I can do tap and pay. Oh, finally. No. no, I can't be doing tap and pay. I need the rewards. No, man. <laughs> tap and pay is amazing. Star. Yeah, you get the stars, man. So, mm-hmm. anyways, all right. So, all moving right. on to more relevant things, we'll talk tap and pay some other time. Yes. All right. Tokenized, uh, tokenized payment systems. So, ASP.NET Core caching. Um, it's extensible. It's awesome. Like you can, you can kind of do your, you can plug it into whatever you want, whether it's Redis or or Disks or some other database or whatever. Like it's pretty cool. And they say, don't roll your own caching implementation. .NET does it better. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Which, no kidding. I, I've, I've rolled my own several times, but I did not have the ability to customize it nearly as much as .NET gives you out of the box. And uh, they just have all sorts of cool strategies that you can just configure, um, you know, like design pattern strategies for, for dealing with cache. And so while you can set up your own hash table and, and whatnot, um, why? Right, exactly. Like they even say, so go into the design pattern, you create your own provider. So they they have this interface that you use as your contract and you just hook your own up and you can be off and running. You want to do it to MySQL? Sure, fine. Postgres? Okay, what? MongoDB? Whatever. You have the freedom to do it. You just have to adhere to whatever contract they have in place for it. Yeah, I was just curious how, if our words was going to write my own cache provider, what would I do it? Because SQL is already provided, right? If you want to store stuff in the database, I'm sure you can do it to to file, right? Um, I'm sure there's like a, I know there's a, like a .NET session server that you can set up to share uh, sessions and, and uh, cache between servers. Um, I guess you could do a SQL Lite. Oh, here you go. We should combine, we, can, we should combine things. We should make a Twitter client. That will save your cached information out to Twitter, and we'll read that that RSS feed back in. <laughs> it just makes sense. Uh, no one, if no one's done this, this is going to be my next project. <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want to. You want to make sure you don't cache anything. Uh, you know, any personally identifiable information there. Oh man, <laughs> oh, that, yeah. that could be like ten episodes worth, I believe. Um, talking about PII. Uh, oh. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Hey, one of the cool things about the .NET Core is you can you can tailor it to your needs. So take take an example like you're a heavy e-commerce site, right? Your top 10 pages are uber important to you. 
like you want to make sure that those things just pop as fast as possible. You store those in memory, and then your less served pages you have cached off the disk. And so that's a way to to make sure that you're not killing the memory on your server, but at the same time you're not having to reprocess all those pages anytime that they're served up. So that's that's kind of cool. And I, I even had a little code sample here uh, that you could do in the web config for it. And it's basically a caching tag. You tell it the output cache, you tell it the provider, so ASP.net or ASP.NET internal provider, and then you tell it, so a disk cache. And you tell it that you're using the disk cache provider, the output cache provider, and um, that's pretty much it. So it's actually kind of simple. Uh, you can do it on a page by page basis. So you could actually in your directive for the page, tell it that the output cache, tell it the duration vary by param. So if you change params on the page, when you're calling it, it doesn't care or it does care. You tell it whether you're doing the disk cache or memory cache. So it's pretty easy stuff to set that up. And actually I just looked up how you would write your own output cache provider and it's dead simple. You, uh, you extend a class provider base and you've got four methods to fill in. Get, add, set, and remove. Nice. And that's it. And you can configure it. So yeah, for doing this for Twitter, really not a big deal. It's totally trivial. And so I'll probably not waste my precious time with it. And not because <laughs> I will fail miserably. <laughs> but yeah, uh, four methods. And uh, someone else should do it. That's killer, man. Yeah, you know, I, I would love to do it actually, but I'm going to be spending the next seven years reading the art of computer programming, volumes one through four. <laughs> well, but only if you're on a deserted island, though, right? Right. Only if you're stranded. Yeah. No, I have and something to prove now. I, I'm the imposter syndrome's kicking, and I can't believe that so many people have actually read any significant portion of these <laughs> these books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just. Uh, I, I, I got to think, though, that the picking the, all the volumes, though, that's the smart pick just for, you know, having the resource to start a fire. Yeah, you need having, lots of pages. Oh, good point. Yeah, some I, I was, yeah, I was interpreting the uh, the um, the poll to be a, what's the best, and that wasn't the question. <laughs> so what would you <laughs> would you take? And these, these guys would make great seats. Um, there's a lot of information there you could read <laughs> for years out of these books. If you need toilet paper, which one's going to provide the most? Uh, wow. <laughs> pulp. Mr. Yeah. Leave, <laughs> leave it to Mr. Bidet. Uh, the <laughs> and who that needs that Ambien when you have the art of computer programming? <laughs> I'm totally kidding. Wow. I'm sure these are really awesome books, and I, I don't mean to make light of them, but it's, it's kind of funny, too. Uh, you went the Ambien route. That's awesome. <laughs> oh. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, Wilson. Yep. Let's get back to caching. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I feel like Alan right. wanted to say I know, something I know better. <laughs> you don't mess with the idols like Nuth. <laughs> say again? I was just digging the hole deeper. We should just move on. Uh, right. Okay, good. <laughs> Nuth is awesome. I'm kidding. He's great. Uh, uh, nothing to see here. <laughs> all right. So we wanted to talk a little bit about... Uh, Caching in memory. So there are some things that can happen with that that aren't so great. Imagine that. Like this is some of the, the bad parts of caching, right? So there's this whole concept called scavenging. So let's say that you have 16 gigs of RAM on your server and all of a sudden all 16 gig are taken up. Well, guess what? If the .NET framework decides it needs some of that memory back, it's basically just going to boot some of your items out of the cache. Is that good? And guess what? Bad? You should not have your application server on the same box as your SQL server because this will happen. Oh, no doubt. Well, if you have it on the SQL server, SQL server will just take up all of the all memory, of it. period, <laughs> yeah. because it's yep. greedy like that. But uh, as far as it being good, though, um, I mean, this is totally one of the reasons why things can be evicted, as you put it, or invalidated or flushed or whatever word of you know, verb of choice you have for something being removed from the cache. But um, even in the examples that I mentioned with like uh, take the HTTP runtime .cache property, right? Um, you know, if if the server determines that the memory is below some threshold uh, that it that it wants for free memory, it'll start uh, evicting items from the cache, uh, you know, to make room, right? Yep. And there's nothing you can do about that. Like that's no, part of the framework. So so is it bad? Uh. I don't know. I mean, 
I don't know. I, I, I it's just part of it, I guess. I, I can't really answer that question. It's like an un- unanswerable question. I think it's one of those things that you just really have to be aware of what's going on in your environment, right? Because let's say that you just cash something and, and it was a heavy process intense thing that got cached. Well, if you've like you mentioned, if there's SQL server running on the same box, guess what? That thing's getting kicked out as soon as it got at it. Well, let's talk about something realistic though, because I feel like that's not Okay, let, let's say that you're on a shared server, right? It, in uh, like in hosting environments or something like that. It, it, this isn't necessarily .NET per se, but if you're in a server environment that's shared, like you're doing, uh, not necessarily virtual hosting or something, but you are literally on a shared box, you can't rely on the caching mechanism there because you, you're contending with who knows how many other different sites on the box or whatever else. So um, well, you're talking about specific to a .NET type of um, shared hosting where literally everyone's on the same instance of IIS. It's just yep. uh, IIS is hosting multiple websites. That single instance of IIS is hosting multiple websites. And in that case, it's the same IIS web server that's running all of them. Well, there's actually a different instance though, right? No. Oh, uh, no. no. Well, it could be different well, app pools. Be- but it doesn't matter. Yeah, the .NET Apple, framework sorry. is managing the memory. So at that point, like it can, it can but choose to But at the app level, them. though, right? Yeah, so, probably. Um, yeah, that's actually a good question, though, for like, I, I've never looked at how that type of situation, how IS is configured in that situation, um, you know, if each one's given a certain amount of memory or not. Hmm. Yep. So, so that's one thing to be aware of. Like scavenging can happen, and you really don't have much control over it. You just need to know. Um. But, um, yeah, I mean, the example that you gave, though, where something was just cached and then immediately removed kind of suggests like there's some kind of... Th- it kind of it suggests to me like there's some kind of thrashing going on, right? Like because, yes. Because typically, it's not going to... Because that would just be a bad... Um, well, maybe we'll get into the programming, the caching algorithms, um, you know, sooner than, rather than later. But the... Um, you know, because one of the one of the um, algorithms that you could use for the eviction could be based on, uh, you know, the age, you know, how old is something, or um, you know, if it's you know something that isn't referenced often, then that's what you would get rid of. Um, so for it to get rid of something that was just cached, kind of suggests that there's like. You're low on memory. There's memory pressure. There's no, yeah, yeah, no memory at all, and and you just cached like one thing because that's all there was space for, and it's already reclaiming it. Then, yep. I don't know. That sounds like a bigger problem. <laughs> it could it could happen though. I mean, because it's not uncommon to cache a result set either, right? Like, let's say that you get a data table back, and it's it's lookup values or something like that. Like, it could be any number of things that you could be caching, but it's not uncommon for uh, you to be caching something that's not a simple value. You know what I'm saying? Um. Yeah. So someone could be anyway. spidering the heck out of you. Happens. Google. Yeah. Uh, used to. Well, that's what I was saying with the, the thrashing. Time. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. I mean, and, and it may be things completely out of your control. Like, <laughs> you know, it might be legitimate things that booted it out, but you don't have control over it. So that's one way that things can get, uh, you know, evicted from the cache, or uh, what was the other word you, you said? Uh, flush, invalidate. Invalidate. That's what I was looking for. whatever. Yep. So the other one is you could literally just have an expiration. You you set a date on it, whether it be an absolute date. So you say a date and time. So say at midnight every night, this thing's going to get kicked. Or you can have a rolling one, right? So as long as somebody accesses that cache, then maybe you add another hour to its life. So... Go ahead. Well, well, I was going to say like uh, a better example of the absolute expiration might not necessarily be like at midnight, but you might say like this is good for the next five minutes. Yeah, totally, totally. And then after that, remove it. Yep. And, and that's that's literally there's a time from the time that this entered until it leaves, whether it's a set time or a time from the time that it entered. That's one. But the rolling expiration is interesting too. That's more like session type stuff. Like if you log into a website, right? It might say that. You're alive for 10 minutes. Like your bank is a perfect example. If you log into your banking application so you can look at your checking account or pay some bills or whatever, typically there might be a five-minute timeout type thing. And as long as you do something in there that causes some sort of server action, it's going to say, hey, this guy's active in here. 
and now let me refresh it so he has five more minutes to mess around. Well, it also kind of plays in with the you know least used uh, caching principle too. That um, you know you you cash that item, and let's say you say that this item is good for five minutes, and then if it's used again within that five minutes, then you add another five minutes onto the timer, yep. and then you know you you know each time it's used, you keep doing that as, as you suggested, right? But if it's not if it's never used during that um, the five minutes, then maybe it wasn't that valuable to have cashed anyway, so it's safe to get rid of. Right. Right. Um, and and maybe like you know I know we're talking about saying it in five minute increments just to make it an easy number, but what if it was something larger, right? You know, like an right. hour, right. or something. Yeah, you want the stale stuff to disappear, right? Um, the next part is stuff that I thought was really cool in the .NET Core caching stuff. Uh, there are ways to where you can check on dependencies and you can define these things. So you can have a key dependency. So let's say that you have um, multiple keys, like we were talking about the key value pairs. You could have one based off another one. So if, if my user ID is based off of, I don't know, uh, a maintenance key, like let's say that you had a maintenance key in your cache that said that, okay, right now there is no maintenance going on, but then you set that cache to say, yeah, there is maintenance going on right now. Then maybe it invalidates your user ID for right now. It's going to log you out and say, hey, you can't do anything right now because the server is in maintenance mode, right? So you can use one key to invalidate some other ones. Uh, go ahead. That's actually, but that's not a concept new to the ASP.NET Core. Does it exist in the old one too? Well, I mean, like I keep bringing this one up and I'll do it again. The HTTP runtime uh, cache property, which again, there's a, a similar, um, you know, the object cache class that's in the system dot uh, something, whatever. Um, where was that one? System dot runtime dot caching uh, that's meant for desktop applications. They have the, this concept of um, the dependencies there as well. So let's say, for example, um, you know, going back to your user example, so there's a user object that you might have cached, and then you might have um, all of that user's payment instruments also cached um, as separate objects. And those payments, you know, and by payment instrument, I mean like, you know, a Visa or an Amex or whatever. So so let's think of this as an e-commerce site or application. And so you you get that query for the user object, and then you also eventually end up querying data to get the their payment instruments and you can set the payment instruments to be dependent uh, to the dependence as dependencies of the user so if the user gets cat um, I'm sorry Changed. if the user gets evicted if that gets cleared from the cache for some reason then those other ones would as well and yep. you know that's part of um, you know that runtime dot cache property yeah that's cool. And then there's you've got also file dependency type thing. So you could literally have a cache item dependent on a file on the disk. So if that thing changes, then it'll clear the other ones from the cache. Uh, SQL Server and .NET obviously has close ties. This looks like it was available from 2005 and above, so hopefully you're at least running on that if this is a thing for you. So you can actually tie it to a table um, apparently they also introduce changes to rows at some point. So those are ones there's an aggregate dependency. So <laughs> this item could depend on multiple items in the cache. So going to your user payment thing, right? Like there might also be, um, your payment instrument might be based on your user object and then the user address or something like that. So if either one of those things change, then it could kick it out. Uh, and then there's also a custom dependency. You can create your own. What do you want this thing to be based on? Which I, I think, it, I mean, it gives you a ton of flexibility, right? Like, it, and it just adds to the whole notion that caching is complex. There's a lot of different ways that you might need to look at this to figure out what's the best way to clear these things out. Yeah, I got curious. So I, I went back and checked on it um, to see how in the, um, going back to that HTTP runtime.cache property, uh, which is using an instance of the system.web.caching uh, cache class. Um, there's a, in the insert method, one of the 
overloads for the insert method is you can specify a cache dependency object that um, you know is like what you said exactly like what you said and, you know um, aggregate cache dependency inherits from it as well as SQL cache dependency inherits from it but uh, you know that's where you can define that relationship very cool Joe you want to hit us on the last one that we got here yeah, sure. I was just thinking about uh, custom caching. Um, uh, I was I was trying to imagine like a, a scenario where I would write a custom one, like don't cache on Tuesday or something. But I'm having a hard time with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, just don't cache at all because it's hard and it's complicated, and you're going to get blamed for everything. Right. Yeah. Who cares about so the speed? Uh, notification <laughs> of uh, cache item removal? Basically, um, you can uh, hook in some sort of event that lets you know when a, a cache item has been removed, which could be useful. I'm, I'm I don't have a, a real good use case I can think of here as well, although it might be kind of nice to have like a, say, alert sent um, if you see a lot of cache items being removed because that would be an example of, um, you know, maybe something funky going on. So that's interesting to know. Um, but other than that. Um, I can actually think of some that I've done. Yep. So, um, well, for one, just from like a, a logging and debug perspective, uh, it can be nice to know when something gets removed from the cache because, again, remember I said that caching was complicated and that you shouldn't do it because you are going to get blamed for it, right? <laughs> and so yeah. inevitably, when you do get blamed for it, um, it's nice if you already have that call back in there so that you can see when it was removed so that you can, um, you know, when you're trying to debug this thing, it's like, oh, yeah, here, here's where it was inserted, here's where it was removed. But then if you were also doing any kind of um, like maybe you have some, how to describe this, uh, some, let's say a class, you know, some object that that's kind of sitting on top of that built in cache. Right. And, and so based off of when things are happening in the cache, uh, in dot nets, you know, cache, then maybe you want to take action on it. And so, um, you know, that's when you can have that callback you know, able to call back into your object so that you can, you know, do whatever you need. I'm doing a horrible job of describing that. But <laughs> you know what? Never mind. Just forget it. Don't use it. It's hard. So actually, Jason from our Slack chat had brought something up along these lines uh, prior to us even starting these episodes. And he had a situation where he needed to cache a certain number of pages on an e-commerce site nightly. This is kind of a decent thing for that. So you could have a callback to where maybe you boot something from the cache and you have it auto re-add it to the cache every night. So it would, you know, a callback could literally be, okay, let's let's put this right back in. You know, we didn't want this thing to exit the cache. This needs to go in immediately because this always needs to be available, right? Because this thing might take 30 seconds otherwise or two minutes or five minutes or whatever the case may be. So that's actually a case to where you could have something like that. You have a callback. I that feel literally like you could solve that differently though, but well, you could, you could. Okay. Okay. So, cause, cause immediately when I was thinking about that, as you were describing it, I'm like, well, why wouldn't you just set the expiration to be like way out into the future? But if in the case, let's say hypothetically that this had, um, you know, not static, not completely static data, but something you know, where it changed frequently enough and maybe, maybe midnight, I think was the example you gave. Maybe yep. that's enough, you know, like it changes once a day then. Okay. Yeah. In that example, I could see where you could use the callback, uh, method as a way to like, you know, re trigger whatever action is necessary to cause it to get recached. Well, let's talk about or the scavenging. A new instance, a new instance of it to be recached. Well, let's talk about the scavenging too. So you want this to happen every night at midnight great, right? You could even schedule something for that. But let's say during the day something happened and it got booted because of some memory pressure, you need that thing back in the cache immediately. Now see, that's the that that's where I feel like you're going to get into danger. It could danger. be dangerous because yeah. of the thrashing, right? Like you don't know why it got this kicked out. This is where you're going to create trouble for yourself. So Maybe. Maybe. But it, it's hard to say. But if it's one of those things that you know needs to be in there, having that callback could be a way to do it. There could be other reasons, but I just thought that that might be one way to where you could say, hey, I'm just going to clear the cache at midnight of all these things and I'll have it go back in and do it, right? I mean, for most purposes, I would kind of lean towards not bothering to cache something until it's you know actually been requested at least the first time. But because like in this case, like what you're describing, you know, if, if it got booted in the middle of the day 
because it needed to be. And then and then not because of um a memory pro- problem, or well, well, not be- not because someone actually requested it, but just because someone coded it, you know, uh, five weeks ago, that it should just automatically, you know, pop itself back into the cache, and then it's going to get into this recursive problem where, you know, it's going to put itself back in the cache, and now it's going to get rid of something else in the cache that was older until eventually it's going to cycle back out again. I don't know. I feel like that's kind of a dangerous way to do it. Yeah, I, I don't I know. I guess it depends on your use case, though. It or does. if you just have a ridiculous amount of memory and you don't have to worry about it. Well, and the other thing that you got to remember, too, is like with e-commerce, like there's other things coming to play. Like if Google indexes your site and your pages are super slow, you get bumped down in the results, right? So it might be something to where you're doing this just so that you know that the crawler comes along. It's not going to see that your page took 30 seconds to load, right? So it might be one of those things that you do need in there. I, I mean, there's all kinds of different I mean, you situations. Don't know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, specific to Google, though, you don't know what time they're coming. Right. So and you wanted to when have When they it. do come, they're only going to allot a certain amount of time. So they're going to try to crawl as, as much as they can in a, you know, in a period of time before they just have to move on because the internet's right. too big. And to so stay. if it's your most important pages, you want to make sure those things are available. So you might not want to do it for every page on your site, but if it's like we talked about earlier, if you have the 10 I mean, I most like important pages. I feel like we just have a whole conversation on SEO Oh, you could. Right now. Totally. I mean, we, we could go on for hours about that alone. But it, I don't know. Like the use case could definitely, but that whole idea of having a callback to where you can do something if it exits, that's amazing, right? Like because you now can act on something immediately. So, I don't know. I, I thought that was really neat. Use that one carefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, at least know your use case, right? And, and know know exactly why you're doing it. All right. So let's go ahead and discuss the resources we like because there are a few. Um. Well, I feel like a lot of these. Let's see. There is the the item. Uh, how to say this, that um, Scott, what was his name? Scott uh, Allen wrote a, um, the, how to use the HTTP context items collection that I referenced earlier. So we'll have a link to his site, but I, I just love his uh, domain. So I have to say the ode to code.com <laughs> um, and we'll include a link to that. Yeah, we've, yeah, got- we've also... Uh- We've got uh, four links here that we'll have in the show notes for things specific to ASP.net. So if you're interested in reading more about uh, the caching, removal notifications, core distributed cache, or core caching, then uh, we've got the links for you. Yeah, and again, these are concepts that are familiar for basically every platform out there. So um, on to that, our tip of the episodes. No, it's, it's totally <laughs> the tip of the week. This is Alan's favorite section, tip of the week. Yeah, we've been doing good lately. Yeah, this this is every two weeks for I a mean, month. I mean, whatever week you are listening to this, it's the tip of that week. Tip of that moment. Maybe that's what we should call this. No. All right, anyways. All right, Joe, what you got? All right, I'm stealing this one from Mr. Automation, who you might remember from our reviews up above. Yeah, He's also a member of our Slack channel, and he sent me a really awesome tool. It's uh, Void Tools. Um, well, that's not the name of the tool. Uh, I think the tool is named Void Tool, but uh, I'm going to double check that right now. If it's called the Everything Search Engine, sorry about that. And what it is is a really freaking fast search for a computer. And if you've ever looked for something in like huh. on your C drive, then you know how miserable that can be. And I don't know why, but this does a great job at somehow indexing your computer. I think it might even run as a service. I'm not really sure how it runs uh, in the background, but it's free and it's freaking fast. And so no more huh. waiting for 10 minutes, going to the bathroom, getting a drink, coming back and seeing if it found your you know, dropbox.exe, true story. Uh, and so you should download this tool. Um, I used to use uh, Agent Ransack for stuff like this, and uh, I still probably will continue to use Agent Ransack because it's got a, a lot of really options, and I like the interface for doing like regex searches and stuff. But Agent Ransack uh, b- builds its indexes as it's searching. So it gets fast for repeated use, but this seems to kind of do that in the background. So it's just really fast for searching for stuff, and I really like it. So everything is I guess you have to really, really like... Tools. I guess you really have to lose stuff on your local system a lot, though. You know, Google used to have uh, a Google desktop. Um, I don't remember what it was called. 
might have just been called Google Desktop Agent. I don't know. Do you remember that, though? I do remember yeah. it, and I think I installed it and uninstalled it, like, quickly. Yeah. I mean, because it, it did the same kind of thing, but you really have to lose stuff a lot locally, which I guess is a problem for Joe, so... <laughs> oh, no, man. This is something that, you know, 20 years ago, people would have said, why do I need to search my email? Don't you organize it? But it's a life changer. <laughs> you don't understand how fast this thing is. Like, I'm typing in Dropbox right now, and, it, like, it does it by letter, right? So as soon as I type the D, I'm looking at every file on my C drive that has the letter D in it. D-R-O. Uh, I've already found it, but it's instant. It's fantastic. Okay, that's cool. I'll be checking it out. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so why organize things when you can just search for them? I agree. That's why well, I, don't I don't believe organize anything. Zero inbox <laughs> is a myth. All right. False. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I was going to say that it was episode 43, but maybe it was, uh, 44. Let me, let me get this real quick. Let me just double check. It was, uh, yeah, it was episode 44. So, um, you know how, like I, I've been called out once or twice for, uh, you know, having to like fact check you guys, you know, <laughs> right? Like that maybe have said, been said, right. And it's like, oh, why does Michael doubt them so much? And it's not like I'm trying to be a jerk or anything, you know, it's just like, you know, it's more like just excitement. Like, oh, wow, really? No way. And, and, you know, of course I got to go check something out. So Alan made this claim in episode 44 that, um, all of this talk about bash on windows was actually going to be amazing. And that, uh, I should take a listen to the show that MS Dev Show did with uh, what was his name, Richard Turner, and uh, you know, give this a listen to and see what I thought about it. And I gotta say, Alan, I was wrong. You were right. The internet just heard that. That just happened. <laughs> you know, listening to this guy, it was amazing. And uh, so. You know, I mean, this guy, like I even mentioned it during episode 44, this guy's whole job is to make the command line cool again. Like how awesome a, a, a title is that, right? So um, we'll include a link to that show again, uh, to the MS Dev show. But I also want to include the instructions, the install guide for the Windows subsystem for Linux, because that is my tip of the week uh, is, you know, update your system so that you can get it. And if you're lucky, you know, depending on your version of Windows <coughs> and not <laughs> Enterprise, then, you know, you can use that and you can have the best version of Linux distribution ever, which turned out to be a Windows distribution, which is really weird when you think about it. But I know if you haven't already listened to that episode, then you're thinking like, man, this guy is crazy. What is he talking about? It's amazing. Just listen to it. I really don't know why... I feel like Microsoft did a disservice when they decided to call it Bash on Windows because it's really so much more than that. It's Linux on Windows. And they they really I don't know why they didn't just flat out call it Linux on Windows because that's really that that states it better in my opinion than to call it Bash. Win Ubuntu. That's what they should have called it. On Linux. Yeah. And it's called the Windows subsystem for Linux, which is also like only a name that Microsoft could come up with, right? Like, I feel like there should be like a Windows subsystem for Linux 2016 professional, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, doesn't it feel like it should be like that? It, 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 why not just have a simple name? But, you know, yeah, that that's Microsoft's uh, naming conventions. Apt get, baby, and it will work. Yeah, it is absolutely crazy. When I listened to that episode, I got so excited. I was like, you know what? I... I need Windows 10 on everything. And immediately, uh, you know, because Windows Subsystem for Linux officially came out, I think, I want to say the date was like August 2nd. And let me see here. The date was, uh, yes, August 2nd. So you need to make sure that you have the Windows 10 anniversary update, which will be build uh, 14.393, all right? And it needs to be, you know, an x64-based processor uh, with either, you know, an AMD or uh, Intel compatible CPU, right? And um, let's see, 64-bit version of Windows is required. Now, well, here's one thing that was confusing to me too: is it was saying like, you know, at the time you have to be a member of the Windows Insider uh, program, uh, but 
you know, it was released on eight two. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, fact is, it's amazing that part. But there, there's some great videos out there of it. There's some, uh, um, <laughs> yeah. You, you listen to that episode of MS Dev Show. It's fantastic. <laughs> I unfortunately haven't had the misfortune of not being able to get it yet because <clears throat> enterprise don't use if you're using windows 10 enterprise then you're not going to be so lucky um unfortunately oh, or at right. least that was my my experience maybe i'm wrong somebody tell me i'm wrong no actually they mentioned it on the ms dev show in one of their episodes they said that it's not available on enterprise uh don't know when it'll be available on enterprise yeah which kind of stinks but you know yeah. Well, I mean, I would say when something freezes over, but then again, we never thought that Linux would run like this on Windows, and yet here no, it is. Never. Right, right. Like literally, in in the way they actually described it too was exactly as you know what we kind of uh, theorized too was that it being like uh, you know using like a facade pattern mm-hmm. um, was. I'm trying to remember everything that Richard said now, but um, yeah, yeah, it's it's cool stuff. If you're lucky enough to to have the anniversary build uh, installed, then you definitely need to take a look. We'll, there'll be a link in the show notes for the install guide for the Windows subsystem for Linux, and you too can have your Windows download the Ubuntu uh, ISO to install Linux on your Windows system, and you have like the best of both worlds there. Now there were some caveats though, because there were some things that they didn't have some interoperability that. They don't have working yet. This is still considered very much beta. Um, so I'm trying to remember like what an example was where like you couldn't um, kick off. Uh, I think like a you couldn't kick off. You couldn't spin off a Windows executable from the Linux side. Yep. There and, were also things like Docker wasn't really available for it yet. Like there there were a few things that they're working on, but they they are constantly working on making. Well, yeah, it they're better. iterating on it. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's because the goal is that, like it'll be seamless. Yep. All right, so my tip of the week. This actually came out of a conversation on Slack that was pretty funny. Like I said, man, if you ever want to look cool like those people on CSI or something, all you have to do is run app get update and app get, you know, install something and then just streams of text fly through on Linux, right? And people are like, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. It, it it was just funny because I, I've definitely gotten that look from people before. Or just tail a log, right? Tail a log, and there's there's just streams of text flying everywhere. Well, Mad Viking God over on Slack said, no, nah, man, when I want to look like I'm doing something cool, I go to hackertyper.net. Just have that open in a window in your browser and push a few keys. And as people walk by, they're like, holy smokes, this dude is amazing. So this thing's awesome. If you go to hackertyper.net and just start typing a few things, it's just spitting out code nonstop. Okay, wait. <laughs> wait a minute. You don't have to push any keys. All you got to do is just push one key and keep it held down. <laughs> I haven't even tried that yet. Yeah, it's really, it doesn't matter. Like, you can try to, like, you you, you can type a bunch of characters just so, like, people hear the, the clicky clacky of your keyboard and they think that you're typing, but really... It doesn't matter what keys you hit, you hit because it's only looking for a key down, not necessarily the specific key. Dude, it's so yeah. No, it doesn't matter what key it yeah. is. You, you just you just punch buttons, and people will think that you're just a mad skilled programmer. And it's in the monochromatic green on black background, so it already looks very geeky, and it's it's absolutely amazing. And it put a big smile on my face when he told me about it. So. That is a compliments of Mad Viking God over on Slack. So, um, you know, have fun with that. Put it up on your screen. Impress somebody. You know, get a raise. <laughs> Who knows yeah, what may come with this? You pretty much want to, you know, anything below your function keys. Don't use the function row or else you're going to get tripped up. And the one key that I have found that actually does what it's supposed to is the delete key. Oh, does it really? <laughs> yeah. If you, if you were to, like, go backspace on it, it goes backspace. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'm thinking of something uh, a little more nefarious and, and truly hackerish. Was basically uh, next time the in laws are in town and they, uh, you know, it's time to go to dinner or, you know, go shopping at the outlet malls and be like, Are you kidding me? Do you see what's going on here? I can't go. Look at this. Look how busy I am. The world is crumbling. 
I've got subroutines to write, man. For, like, for <laughs> some reason, Russians. I, for some reason, I assumed that you were going to describe that you were going to just leave that full screen on like your parents' computer, and then they like press a button and they're like, "Oh my god, what did I just do? Why am I writing code suddenly?" <laughs> Dude, oh no, that amazing. involves more work for me. <laughs> I'm usually more interested in getting out of things. Uh, that's killer. All right, so that wraps up our tips of the week. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, so last episode, uh, episode 45, we talked about hardware latency, and we showed how uh, saving copies of your data to faster and closer locations can save you, uh, I mean, just astronomical amounts of time. And uh, in this episode, we fo- focused on a particular web framework and discussed some of the tools and frameworks, uh, some of the tools that frameworks provide you, uh, the programmer. And uh, don't forget that there are also lots of other layers in place, things like ISP, CDNs, uh, browser cache, all sorts of other things that come into play. But we just wanted to focus on the kinds of things that uh, are available to you in the framework that you're currently working in. And uh, we took a look at caching in ASP.NET. And in future episodes, we're planning on, I feel like we keep saying this, but we're planning on diving into some of the more computer science-y type things and caching, uh, taking a deeper look at some of the algorithms and data structures that we discussed today and uh, looking at some common common strategies. Uh, so things like search engine CDNs and also um, like very programmer-specific uh, techniques like memoization that can make uh, huge differences in performance. And we hope you enjoyed it. So with that, Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, more. Use your favorite podcast app. And like we've said before, be sure to leave us a review. You can visit codingblocks.net slash review to find links to Stitcher and iTunes. Yep. And up there, you'll also find our show notes, examples, discussions, and more. Yeah. So send your feedback, questions, and rants to comments at codingblocks.net and follow us on Twitter at codingblocks or head over to codingblocks.net and you'll find uh, social links and uh, really uh, advanced show notes where you can leave really awesome comments. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> or, or not so awesome. <laughs> I like the advanced show notes. <laughs> I'm no, gonna... We got markdown. <laughs> we do have some markdown. Check out our advanced show notes. <laughs> <laughs>